Good evening and welcome to JW3. My name is Michelle Heyer and I'm the Holocaust Education Programmer. I'm delighted to welcome you all from wherever you are in the UK or around the globe to join us today for this important discussion on Holocaust denial and distortion. The event is supported by Genesis Philanthropy Group. Genesis are key partners for JW3 and we thank them with gratitude for their support. Having worked in Holocaust education for several years, I find it shocking and incomprehensible that this discussion must still be had. Sadly, there are people out there who continue to write, broadcast and post on social media claiming the Holocaust didn't happen or they distort the truth. Fake news and conspiracy theories persist in the headlines and on social media. Why are these views granted a public forum? Is it right for offensive comments, particularly dangerous ones, to remain online? Last year, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg introduced a new policy for his site, prohibiting any content that denies or distorts the Holocaust. It comes after what he claims was a struggle with the tension between free speech and hate speech. He admitted that his own thinking had evolved following an increase in anti-Semitic violence. However, just years prior in 2018, he defended the fact that Holocaust denial was permitted on his platform. I'm Jewish, he said at the time, and as a set of people that deny the Holocaust happened, I do find it deeply offensive, but at the end of the day, I do not believe Facebook should take, down, take that down because I think there are things that different people get wrong. The outrage was swift and overwhelming. Decades back in 1996, Holocaust denial had brought more into the, was brought more into the public domain as author David Irving sued American academic David Lipschatt, Deborah Lipschatt after she accused him of being a denier. He was charged and the internationally acclaimed denial film was released later. The story was shown on the big screen and gave the subject even more attention and scope for debate. And tonight, we have two experts who can offer us more insight into this heated topic. Mark Weitzman chaired the Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial and is currently chairing the Museums and Memorials Working Group. He was an architect of IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, adoption of the working definition of antisemitism, which is the first definition of antisemitism with any formal status and the lead author of IRA's working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion. Carol Cadwallader is a British author and investigative journalist. She writes for The Guardian and The Observer newspapers and rose to international prominence for her reporting on Facebook Cambridge analytical scandal, analytical data scandal, for which she is nominated for a finalist in the 2019 Pulitzer Prize. She has also done much research into Google, which shockingly emphasised Jew hatred and Holocaust denial. The event will be chaired by Lord Daniel Finkelstein, OBE, associate editor and weekly columnist for The Times newspapers. Daniel's parents were both Holocaust survivors. I would particularly like to mention the survivors that are joining us this evening. This must be so incredibly difficult for you to experience denial and distortion of the trauma you have experienced. I can only hope that you are comforted by the work of experts and journalists trying to reveal and counter this ignorance and bigotry. Thank you all for attending virtually this evening. The temporary closure of our JW3 building due to COVID-19 means we could not welcome people in the same way, yet we've been able to offer arts, culture and education remotely. We will continue to open more fully as government restrictions lift. And this will also continue to make these, and we'll also continue to make these events accessible online. You'll be glad to hear there'll be an opportunity for questions afterwards. You will see there's a space on the screen you are watching to type your questions. You don't have to wait until the end. Please submit your questions throughout the discussion. So for now though, over to you, Daniel. Michelle, thank you very much indeed, and uh, good evening to everyone. Let me uh, welcome to the uh, panel uh, Mark and Carol, um, so that uh, we'll have them both up. Excellent. Thank you both for joining me and for joining this event. Uh, I want to begin our conversation, I think, asking you this first, Mark. 
What actually is Holocaust denial? Thank you, uh, Daniel, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to uh, Michelle and to JW3 for the invitation to participate in this evening's program. Um, Holocaust denial, on the face of it, is the outright denial or claim that the Holocaust never took place. Um, the reality is that Holocaust denial and even Holocaust distortion were built in to the Nazis' program from the very beginning. The euphemisms that they used, the final solution, resettlement to the East, special handling, terms like that, were all meant to cover up the reality of the genocide that the Nazis were implementing to destroy, literally destroy, the population of uh, the Jewish population of Europe. Um, so from the very beginning, there has been this kind of attempt to obfuscate and fog over the uh, reality of what happened. After World War II, uh, there were a couple of strains of Holocaust denial uh, became very strong. One, of course, was the self-preservation strain of those accused of being Nazi war criminals, of having collaborated with the Nazis. Obviously, those were uh, members of the, uh, the Nazi uh, party or, or the uh, uh, Wehrmacht, the German army, and, and ethnic collaborators in the countries that were occupied, who all had a, uh, a more than vested interest in trying to either uh, minimize or, or pretend that the crimes they'd been implicated in and committed had not in reality happened. Um, but then there was a strain that came out of, uh, beginning in France, there were two different strains. One was a strain that was kind of uh, almost a literary strain, a literary critical strain that culminated, began with, with survivors of the uh, some of the German camps. Um, who, and again, we have to remember that the camps in Germany were not the extermination camps of Auschwitz, Bergen, Belsen, Sobibor that were located on, on Polish occupied soil. Um, but these were the camps such as Buchenwald and, and so on. Um, and some of the survivors there uh, who were political prisoners for various reasons, either anti-Semitic uh, uh, background themselves, uh, but began to write that they didn't believe that the uh, mass extermination had happened. And moreover, they claimed that Nuremberg was victor's justice. They claimed that the Nuremberg trials were rigged um, and they began to do some analysis of texts uh, and this culminated with uh, Robert Forsan, who was a French professor who died just a few years ago, who actually spent part of his career trying to prove, for example, that the diary of Anne Frank was a hoax because he felt that that was the most prominent piece of uh, autobiographical material witnessing that came out of the uh, Holocaust. And if you could prove that was a hoax, the whole edifice would collapse. Um, in the Anglo tradition, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, we saw more of a uh, almost uh, historical approach or a pseudo historical approach building up the, the scholarly apparatus, David Irving, who was mentioned in the introduction, being the most prominent example of that, the so-called Institute of Historical Review in the United States, um, being the, the locus of these uh, 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 efforts. And this was really the attempt to kind of create an infrastructure, an international infrastructure and pseudo-academic, uh, um, you know, cloaked in pseudo-academic apparatus that uh, would deny the Holocaust from an historical aspect. Um, that effort collapsed with the Irving trial when uh, Judge Gray found that Irving was a neo-Nazi, uh, was an anti-Semite, and uh, as Richard Evans uh, thoroughly dismantles his historical pretensions um, and exposed him for what he was. What we are left with today then are two essential versions. One is the hardcore um, version exemplified perhaps by uh, the state of Iran where Holocaust denial and, and cartoon contests that deny the Holocaust and so on are part of state policy. And that has been picked up by radical elements, uh, anti-Israel elements in the Islamist world um, and in some of their supporters in the West as well. And the other is a form of Holocaust distortion, not denial, um, but Holocaust distortion, which in some ways is more insidious. insidious. It basically does not, declare, uh, does not declare that the Holocaust never, never happened, but it basically tries to uh, distort the reality of what happened to, in effect, whitewash local collaborators to claim that the uh, implications or the numbers were not so great, or to do uh, various ways of minimizing the impact and the effect. And we see this in places uh, very often government sponsored, uh, Hungary, Lithuania, um, Poland, for example, um, and a number of initiatives that are coming out of those countries which veer in that direction and have led to an outright assault on the memory of the Holocaust and the institutions that grew out of it that uh, basically undermine, uh, un undergird our Western democracies today.
Thank you, Mark. Carol, you're, you're, you know, as a journalist, you're a sort of specialist in challenging uh, people's evasion of truths. And so I wondered when you looked at this, whether you thought there was a difference of nature in Holocaust denial or merely a difference in scale. Holocaust is a big thing to lie about and um, there's a difference in scale. Or is there something special about Holocaust denial that isn't shared by other forms of evasion of the truth, disguising one's actions, saying things that aren't the case? Oh, lots of questions there. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer them all, but I shall have a go. Um, Thank you so much, actually, for being here. It's sort of, um, it's really interesting. I think, you know, um, I, I feel very honoured to like have this conversation with you both. It's such an important one. And I mean, one of the things which just struck me from the introduction and from what Mark has just said was just this, these references to David Irving and the fact that, as you sort of said, is that actually in a court of law, he was found to be an anti-Semite. His arguments were found to have no merits. He was completely debunked in the evidenced frame space that we, at that time, we, we, we collectively belonged to, that we operated inside this reason-based, evidence-based kind of information sphere. And now that has completely gone. And that is the difference to what is happening now. And actually, it was... So, you know, I've spent essentially four and a half years sort of investigating the ways that technology has completely disrupted our world in these very profound ways. And it really was Holocaust denial that was my sort of entry point into it. And I think that's kind of really fascinating in itself in that I think, you know, anti-Semitism is so often the sort of canary in the coal mine, isn't it, in terms of that. But it was in the course, essentially, of the, the first bit of my investigation, it actually brought me face to face with David Irving again, because David Irving had had a completely second wind from the Internet. And it was quite astonishing. You know, I went to um, it's for a Channel 4 news item, um, went to visit him and to sort of see I saw on his computer the messages that he was getting. And it was this completely new generation of people who had found him on the internet. And they'd found him through mainstream searches, just through searching on YouTube and Google for the Holocaust. These young people were finding David Irving. And that was sort of like one of the most sort of profoundly disturbing aspects of this. And um, I mean, I just, I can, I'll just tell you the story briefly of, because this, as I sort of said, this the, the whole sort of pulling on the string, which led me to investigate Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, and then afterwards the referendum and the Trump campaign, was Googling, putting Jews into the Google search bar was where it all began for me. And it was just a few days after Trump um, had got elected. And I just started thinking this, you know, this, this term fake news had come into the sort of public domain for the first time. And there was a little, there'd been some focus on Facebook, but I just got interested in looking at Google. And I just put do, I just thought, oh, I'm just trying to test out how Google search works. And so I just thought I'd try some, some, some different types of words into the Google search bar. And I put Jews, and then I tried to make it into a question. And so I put are Jews, and I got this drop down results, like suggestions. And the first one was are Jews evil? And I then had a whole page of results, every single one of which went to bizarre, small, micro, you know, unheard of sites, but which all were hosting articles saying, yes, Jews are evil. And then there was a suggestion bar on the right hand side on Google. And the next search that it suggested I do was, did the Holocaust happen? And I clicked on that, and the very top result was a storm, Stormfront, the Nazi website, and every single result beneath it was Holocaust denial. And, you know, for me, it was this moment of, like, I kind of, like, went down the rabbit hole because I was just couldn't believe what I was looking at. And, you know, I was trying it in different computers and on my phone, and, you know, the results were repeating. And that it was because of that search and what I found out that became my first article. And then 
everything stemmed from there because I just got this total denial from Google that this was a problem. Meanwhile, they started hand altering the results. And there was a sort of enormous, I published this first article and there was a real furore and the, the piece went viral. But then nothing happens and Google didn't do anything about it. And it was just, it was just this whole thing for me, which was that normally as a feature writer, I do a feature, I move on to the next subject. And I just thought, this cannot stand. They can't get away with this. And so that was literally, I then wrote about it the next week. And then I wrote about it for the next five or six weeks. And eventually what happened is Google, the sort of like it started getting more publicity. And in the end, Google had to like update their entire algorithm. Okay, so they did get rid of the result, but it was only after this sustained public pressure. And the biggest takeaway for me is, sorry to bang on, but it was that, okay. so they, they didn't know what was happening. And it's still, we still don't know why that was happening. And we still don't know how long those, you know, completely dodgy results were out there for. And, um, you know, and there's so, so the sort of journey that I've gone on now, which is that the fact that there is no accountability of these tech platforms for spreading these lies and this hate is we're still in that situation. And we're in that situation where no government or parliament on earth has any power to do anything about it at the moment. So sorry, well, that's a really long winded explanation. No, it was not a lot. No, no, no. It was, it was, it, both of you provided a very good base for the conversation. So I'm really grateful to both of you. That's exactly what I, I fished for and what I got. <laughs> uh, let me, let me just try and drill down a bit. Um, uh, at the beginning, Michelle talked about both of my parents and uh, why my mother was in Belson concentration camp. My father was deported by the Soviets to uh, uh, to Kazakhstan, part of Siberia. Uh, and um, various of his friends and relatives, the fathers were killed at Katyn. And as you'll be aware, the, um, the Soviets, when the Nazis found these bodies in Katyn, blamed the Nazis. And they maintained that position until 1990 and it not all people have abandoned this false theory um if someone were to expound that theory uh what sort of denial is that is that in the same category as holocaust denial the reason i'm i'm asking you this question so you understand where i'm going i want to come to the regulatory and um and moral responsibilities that these social media companies have for the content they put out. So I want to establish what we what the boundaries are. So here is a here is a similar but not the same uh, historical libel, um, a denial of a, of a, of what was in fact the, a crime, a Nuremberg crime. I know that because the Soviets accused the Nazis of having committed it at Nuremberg, uh, but they committed it uh, and subject to repeated denial is that in the same category and if it is not so that we can be precise and we know what we're asking the social media companies why isn't it mark carol do you want to no no mark, that definitely went for you <laughs> All right. um so here's here's the yes but or or you know they're similar but they're not the same um it's not the same because it's, a it's not holocaust um, directly. Um, but it is an issue of what we call memory laws or memory uh, wars that is going on throughout, but not just Eastern Europe, but the West as well. Um, I, I'm here from New York for the United States, and our country is roiling right now with issues over uh, statues to Confederate uh, you know, uh, uh, participants, generals, and so on in the Civil War. Um, so it is not just you know a, a current issue. It could be going back you know 150 years ago already. Um, and it's not just the European issue, um, but it is in this context. So I will say that um, there is certainly cat in denial going on the same way that there are still issues with the Armenian genocide. Um, and all those are historical issues of denial and distortion. Um, Putin's Russia has been a prime font of misinformation in that regard. Uh, when he was in uh, Israel for the 75th commemoration of the uh, liberation of Auschwitz, he made a controversial, misleading, um, statement about the origins of the war that uh, eminent historians and eventually even Yad Vashem itself, the Israeli National Holocaust Memorial, pushed back against um, because it was a blatant, uh, basically outright lie that he made at the presence of other world leaders. Um, there is an issue in the Soviet Union as one of the countries, Soviet Union, I'm sorry, Russia is one of the countries 
that has passed the law recently uh, regulating historical, uh, what can be said about the history of World War II. And we know of at least one blogger, for example, who was convicted for having uh, written, which is 100% accurate, that uh, Soviet Union and Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939, was the trigger to um, set off World War II. Uh, it is a total factual statement, and yet it is a punishable in, uh, in Putin's Russia today. Um, so that is part and parcel of, of the same issue. Um, but I want to take this a little bit further, and, and this goes back kind of what to Carol was saying as well, is that the presence of this material online is not new and it's not novel. I started researching this and found this, and it goes back to the really mid-late 1980s as well. Um, in the old dial-up BBS systems, at the very beginning of, uh, of, the, of what became known as the internet, um, in the massive, there was that massive conference at Oxford, Remembering for the Future in, in uh, 2000. Um, and I gave, I published, I think, one of the first papers then that dealt directly with Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism online. Um, and it was the only, uh, the only paper in this three volume massive piece of work that was devoted to the topic. And what I found was essentially already at that time, they were the same type of material that we see much more sophisticated versions of today, but there was outright anti-Semitism, there was a, a, a library of material, there were references, there were finger pointing at race traitors and uh, enemies of, you know, of, of, uh, of the movement and so on. And it was a, and it was a form of uh, setting up communication and meetings um, and it brought people together. You know, all the seeds were planted there at that time already. Uh, what we're seeing though is a couple of variants right now. One is obviously the growth and sophistication has made it both you know, globalized in a way that I don't think anybody ever imagined previously. Secondly, is at that time, they were still gatekeepers. You had to go through and the company was able, the, uh, the internet provider was able to kind of serve as a gatekeeper, an editor or whatever, to what was put out generally. Say with the advent of social media and, and, and everyone is a producer, everyone uh, provides their own content, um, everyone is an influencer and so on and so forth, from TikTok to Instagram, um, it's become, and, and Carol, you were 100% correct on this, it has become too hard to control. Facebook has no idea what material is being put out on Facebook. Google, I'm sure the same thing. And those are the ones that are ostensibly at least making an effort. When you get to places on the more kind of radical wild west side of things like uh, uh, what used to be HN and, and now is Akun or, or even some of the Reddit slots or places like that, um, it's just caveat emptor, basically. It's, it's just a wild west show out there. Carol, should it before we go on to the question of whether or not um, Facebook should cover these things and how we regulate that, let's ask the first question, which is: Should this be illegal? Um, should if someone said, um, "I believe that only a million people died in the Holocaust, um, that uh, they all died of disease, there wasn't a uh, the gas chambers is a myth." Um, should that untruth be illegal? Well, I'm a great fan of Germany's laws on this and their enforcement of the tech companies. Germany is the only country in the world which has any kind of enforcement around these issues uh, with the tech companies. And what's kind of fascinating about it is that, so therefore, these, these the problems that we see, uh, you know, they, that, that they, they don't exist on the German internet in the same way. And what, one, one of the completely fascinating facts for me is that Facebook, so what, I think it's, it's one in six moderators who are employed for Facebook work on German language content because of this because there's a legal compulsion to deal with that content. And so I look at it this and I think this is just capitalism. It's just money. This is the problem with these tech platforms. They could do so much better if they just spent more money. They just hired more moderators. They paid them better. They treated them better. And they just actually, like, they did just do a better job of enforcing their own regulations. They have regulations on that. They just don't enforce them. And they don't enforce them because they're lazy and they don't spend enough money enforcing them. They don't make it high enough priority and they prioritise profit over that. And I just think that's morally unacceptable and we shouldn't, you know, and this right. is, and this is the, so 
that, you know, it's not even, you know, a lot of this, remember, is that you don't even need new laws. I mean, we have laws in this country about inciting violence, for example. So there is a whole swathe of content which should be, no, you know, which we, it, it is, is illegal under our laws to be up there. But we have this kind of idea that somehow the internet is different, that it's not like real life. And we know that, you know, if stuff was posted in the street, that it, there would be action taken. That shouldn't, we shouldn't treat the internet any different in that right. sense. Would it, would it be illegal um, in the street to um, write an article and put it on a poster uh, that argued that only 5 million people died in the Holocaust, for example? So where do you, where, I'm just looking about where you draw the line here. I'm, uh, because I would share your view that that, that these organisations, I've urged it on them, that they've got moral obligations um, which go beyond their mere self-interest. Uh, but here we're discussing whether or not they'd ought, these ought to be legal obligations, and that's what I'm investigating. Yeah, no, so I get your point, which is I was talking about the sort of like incitement to viol violence elements of it, which is, I mean... <sighs> I mean, I, I have to say is that uh, I, I would come, uh, so maybe this isn't sort of, the, the, you know, the, the, I think one of the issues around the internet and the regulation of it is that these are American companies. They're based in Silicon Valley and they encode American values. And the American interpretation of free speech is like nowhere else is in the world. And it means that it's applied in countries where there is also, it can that the, the need for protection is um, uh, uh, as as much of a deal as the is is also like of merit and where you know you you know that in communities in places like Sri Lanka for example where the misinformation does and has led to violence so I mean I I I, I mean I, as I say uh, on this particular issue I just look at Germany and I think that they um, that we we sort of you know, because they've had to, because of this having to deal with the historical past, I think they have come to some um, conclusions that perhaps the rest of the world should look to. In, in, I mean, I don't know. I'm interested to hear what you think about this. Mark, do you think? As, as we, the, the, I'm sorry, Dan. Can I just, as, an, as the American in the group, <laughs> respond there? <laughs> um, I'll take out my, you know, flag. No, but um, seriously, I actually, this is an issue that has been thinking back for really quite a number of years and been involved with, and to a certain extent, I think that um, there's a bit of a misleading sense of um, American free speech, um, you know, the position of, uh, of uh, American fr and free speech. It's not um, as broad, perhaps, as many people think it is. So first of all, um, what we're talking now about between the uh, companies, the ISPs and service providers, um, is a private business contractual arrangement. It is not a governmental issue. Um, the everyone, no one reads the fine print, the boilerplate material that you you know just scroll through and check off to get to where you want to go. But many of them, including the larger ones, have anti-hate speech. Let me put it that way: clauses in there that you technically have agreed to abide by, or else the contract is null and void. So when we appeal to them. Um, we're talking about living up to the standards that they themselves have set up as a private contractual agreement. That is not a First Amendment government um, you know, censorship issue. Um, at the same time, I do agree with what you were saying earlier. Um, I think you're onto something, and I, again, I've argued this for a long time, that you know, laws grow out of specific needs and social and historical context and so on. So Germany clearly has laws, um, and I would argue, as you said, Carol, appropriately so, um, dealing with uh, the banning of selling, uh, you know, Nazi propaganda material and so on. The United States has laws against um, protesting while wearing a mask. Those were set up to deal with the KKK who went around in their white sheets and hoods and so on. Um, Germany would have no need of that because that's a totally foreign concept. The U.S. has not had suffered on lived under a Third Reich, so you know we don't necessarily have to deal with selling uh, Nazi propaganda. Um, but there has to be some form, and I think this is the issue that needs to be worked out, some way of respecting the um, the applicable laws from a democratic society. And again, I, I don't want to be supportive of censorship in, in she's China or Putin's Russia and so on, but in a place like Germany or France or the UK or the US, there has to be some way of establishing a norm where even a globalized industry that is based in California can respect and abide by 
the local requirements in those places. But I want to add two further points that I think complicate matters somewhat. Um, Daniel, when you mentioned the, the question, can you say 1 million or 5 million is that denial? Context matters, and the IRA definitions both include the, the, that uh, sense of context matters, because who is saying it and to what purpose? If you're a Nazi propagandist, the neo-Nazi propagandist, that's one thing. Um, a recent survey by the Claims Conference, which is you know this huge organization uh, representing the survivors and their interest in, in negotiations with Germany and so on for reparations, last fall came out with the finding that Gen, you know, Gen Z and millennials um, I think 11 or almost uh, at least 11 percent were woefully misinformed about the Holocaust, including blaming the Jews for in some way for creating the Holocaust. And I think up to 40 or 50 percent, maybe even more, I don't recall offhand, um, really thought it was two million or less. They're operating out of ignorance. That's not the same thing. And we can't penalize them. We shouldn't wish to penalize them from, you know, as the same as a David Irving, shall we say. And the other part is in the law of unintended consequences, we have come across, I know of at least two or three people, uh, uh, someone in Ukraine appealed to me because we deal with Facebook directly, I deal with them directly, asked me to intervene. There are a couple of other cases where good guys, people who are exposing Nazi, neo-Nazi marches or posting uh, educational material contrary to Holocaust deniers, US Holocaust Memorial Museum, for example, ran into cases where Facebook took ban their posts because they showed someone wearing a yellow star or they had the word neo-Nazi march or something like that. Can't even get explanations from it. Um, and so Facebook is applying it in some random may, way that is actually hurting the good guys and either letting or just uh, equally with the bad guys. So this goes back to what Carol was talking about earlier. Who is moderating? Who is the content moderator? And what are they basing their decisions on? And that is very opaque. That we can't seem to get to the bottom of it. Well, look, co content moderation will always vary in quality and, and you know, inevitably you'll get some errors and you, you can't, I think, sweat that too much. But but I but what worries me is a bigger picture thing. Are we sure that if we use the tools of state censorship effectively, um, as is we're discussing, to prevent people from making these libelous statements, um, are we sure that the truth is what's going to win? Um, are we sure that it isn't going to be the lie that actually wins? Because not in every uh, country can we guarantee that the uh, people who are in power have an interest in the truth. So, for example, in Iran, that is a state uh, Holocaust denial is a state-sponsored conspiracy. Um, even though the results of a free of a free speech free for all may be sometimes dispiriting, uh, I, I don't mind who answers this, Carol or Mark. Um, maybe would be safer than acknowledging the idea that the state can intervene to determine which version of history is acceptable to uh, to propound legally. Carol, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I'm thinking about that. I mean, I think we're, we're talking about a specific thing, aren't we? We're talking about Holocaust denial specifically. So I sort of feel that I feel that we're not asking for the state to to rule on, you, you know, I don't, I don't know, like who is the best prime minister or something. It's about a very specific historical event for which there is very well evidenced um, facts, and it's you know we this is a this is a this is a, a fundamental. Um, you know, it's a fundamental respect, and um, I mean, it has a it, you know, it, it has a special historical status that we want to make sure never happens again. And this is a way of trying to ensure that, of trying to of, um, having this respect for the for the truth and for the facts of this particular historical event is very important. I think we recognise that. And um, so I don't I don't feel like this is we're asking for a sort of blanket decisions on blanket subjects here. Sorry, that was really inarticulate. I'm sorry. No, no, so, no, no, no. On the contrary, honey, you, uh, you give these brilliant answers and then you end up apolog and you apologize for them at the end. I don't know why. Um, Mark, uh, do you do you share that view? Um, I, as I think I alluded to earlier, I'm kind of queasy with state censorship in general. 
Um, it may be, again, my American background. Um, um, but uh, I just, I, I recall, uh, I think it was uh, Isaiah Berlin who, who wrote, um, flat, I don't remember exactly when, but obviously the latter part of the 20th century, that one of the issues that, uh, that are really facing, the, uh, the fundamental issues facing us today in, in Western society is not differentiating the good choice from the evil choice, but differentiating between two competing good choices and which one has priority. Um, and I think that's kind of the issue that we're facing here. Um, the, the reality is there is a political factor to this. Um, states are built on historical events, um, whether it's, it's you know, the, the French Revolution or whether it's World War II or whether it's, again, our American Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all those were realities that happened and to deny that reality means denying, in some cases, the underpinning of the legitimacy and the origin of the state itself. It doesn't mean that nothing should be questioned. It doesn't mean that history cannot revise interpretations of it. Um, again, going back to you know American history, we were taught that the war, was, uh, civil war, sometimes was uh, fought depending on where you came from. To free slaves, sometimes was fought for economic interests. Um, those are competing definitions. Um, or interpretations, but denial of the reality of what happened is very often comes with a political intent. And the intent is to undermine the legitimacy of the state. I think in some ways, that's what's going on with Holocaust denial and distortion today. With Holocaust distortion, the ones and you know that I'm thinking of, let's say coming out of Poland or uh, Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, Hungary, and so on, are very often attempts by extreme nationalist groups to whitewash the history of collaboration and to basically restore this, this glorious myth um, of, of a reality that never really existed um, prior to and including up to the uh, occupation during World War II. Um, and it's, it's basically it's legitimizing and sanitizing an extreme nationalist perspective of history. Um, I think in the West, what we're finding is the Holocaust is identified in many ways with the bedrock institutions of Western civil society and liberal democracy, meaning the United Nations, the EU, the concepts of uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes tribunals, and even human rights and so on. Um, all the argument can made that they were all birthed out of the reaction to the Holocaust. If you want to undermine those, if you want to undermine the foundations of Western democracy and, 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 uh, and, and society, then you have to attack the founding myth in the sense that 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 you know that uh, that breathes um, air into those. And I think that's what's going on. So states have a competing you know compelling interest in establishing the truth, but perhaps that's better done by affirming the truth rather than cracking down on those who deny it. And, and also, if I can just as well, it, there's an easier way as well. We don't have to invoke the state, I don't think. And in, the, in, the, in, in so much of this misinformation is being spread by the platforms. You know, it's these. There is, there is, there is. You know, Facebook, Google, to a lesser extent, Twitter. I mean, the these are now the sort of the beating hearts of our information system. And they're also where this toxic misinformation is being spread. And the platforms, as you say, Mark, they already have rules against this. You mm -hmm. know, Holocaust denial has been banned on Facebook. Why doesn't it just enforce its own rules? I mean, that is the real question of it. So okay. I do 100%. think, I do let think me, let me this is a sort of, the, it, the, in a sense, that the, 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 yeah, the, we don't have to go there, I don't think, in terms of right. what you're saying. So let me put that question, actually, the question you've just asked, I, I want you, I want to, you to help me answer. Uh, and that is um, the scale of this, okay? So I've long argued, and the Times is the paper that I work for, has argued, um, these these are these are platforms. These platforms are publishing platforms, and they ought to take responsibility for what is on their platform. And we've argued that. But I always worry when we do one of these editorials that it's not very practical. That um, that, that the issue isn't that it will reduce their profits, but that actually it's just simply something they couldn't cope with. That it would be that it would bankrupt these organisations if they started to effectively kind of hand investigate. Uh, 
every issue of somebody being balmy on Facebook, right? Um, admittedly, we're being quite specific about a single issue, but of course it would mean it means scanning for that issue on everything. And in addition, avoiding taking down posts which are the other side exposing these problems but happen to use the same images for example so because you're the expert on this which is why i'm so thrilled to have you on what is your feeling about the scale issue that how practical is what we're asking facebook and twitter and other social media to do can they do this or would it be the end for them and they'd go bust so, I mean, I would love that. I mean, how amazing would it be if, like, Facebook went bust because it was spending so much money on content moderation? I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the number of content moderators it employs worldwide and the conditions in which they work and the wages they're paid, it is absolutely appalling. And, you know, meanwhile, they are making – is it uh, – is it $2 trillion? It's just like it's more money than anybody, <laughs> anybody on earth knows what to do with. So, and this is, so you like literally, as I sort of said, is that I think somebody had done this calculation, which is that if you employed content moderators just at the level that deals with German content, it would be less than half a percent of Facebook's annual profit. I mean, so I, I just question why on earth aren't they doing it? You know, when we all know that there is this vile, toxic, violence, inciting content all across their platforms. And, you know, the, the only exciting thing I would say about your coup, Mark, I'm sorry about that, but it was <laughs> people who've been shouting about disinformation for the last four years. It was a pretty exciting moment because it was like mm -hmm. this is literally what happens. You are literally seeing it in action. I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought that up because I think <laughs> that the result of that actually had some of the impact that we're talking about now because the investigations, whether FBI or, or whatever, um, did turn and use social media posting as evidence. Um, and that put more pressure on the tech companies to begin to worry for their own, you know, their own health and uh, in reaction to congressional. The only reason Facebook and Google um, actually banned Holocaust denial was because it was raised in congressional hearings. Otherwise, they would have ignored it. That, that pressure is enormous. And they're worried about that. And that's one of the levers that we have to hopefully make them somewhat responsive. But I agree 100 percent what, what they're putting their efforts at moderation are, are you know puny compared to what's out there. Um, but actually, and, and here's the rub of it though, it's and I said earlier, we, we often graded these companies, and, and Facebook has generally been one of the most responsive. So it you know it generally is up there with a B plus or so, which is one of the higher grades that we, we would give. But there are places like Gab and, and other uh, ones that are actually, I'm gonna say sympathetic if not to the anti-Semitic or Holocaust denial arguments, but to the necessity for giving them the open space to make those arguments. And they're coming from an ideological basis. They're not necessarily operating only on a for-profit basis. Um, and they are much more resistant to these kind of, of efforts. So I don't know if we're ever going to get to a position of, you know, I, I don't think the genie is going back in the bottle. We can basically... Um, maybe have impact on Google and Facebook, which thankfully, if that does work, will hit the majority of people who, and I'm talking about their feeders as well, you know, Instagram and TikTok and, and so on. But there's always going to be, the same way as it's always been, um, material out there. And instead of coming in a brown paper wrapper, it's going to be coming from a gab or something like that. But at least they're marginalized. At least they don't have the wide range impact of the, you know, of the major companies. So I think that that at this point, that's maybe the best that we're looking to accomplish on a short term basis. And, and can, I just, can I just pop in again here? So, Daniel, you know, beneath your articles, when they're published, they're, there are comment threads yeah. open, aren't there? Now, yeah. if, if so, if somebody popped into one of those comment threads and started spreading vicious lies, inciting violence, saying the Holocaust didn't happen, the, the, the Times would feel 
like not just a legal responsibility, but also a moral responsibility. Yeah. To do something about that, wouldn't it? I mean, it's just it, it, it's, it does remove those comments. And in fact, we've got a picture on it now. We are we've begun to remove comments that are even just kind of rude to other people on the thing. So, um, I, and I think that's actually good. I don't I don't see why we would want to publish people being rude to each other. We wouldn't publish it on the letters page. So I don't see why we should let people publish it online. And the only question is the practicality of it. So we've, we've, we've answered some, some good questions, I think. I'm going to rattle through some questions from our audience, if that's all right. Um, uh, and um, a good opening one, actually, is this. Are, are there people who genuinely believe the Holocaust didn't happen? Or are they just promoting anti-Semitism and fake news. What's your judgment, Mark, of the of the kind of um, the authenticity of some of this? In other words, is it is it merely is it done merely as a provoking exercise, or are these people actually expressing a genuine view? Again, there is some context necessary, which is that if a person is coming from a place where there is little to no education about the Holocaust, then it's basically been. Um, you know, an environment where they haven't learned about it, it is possible that there is a, you know, a question mark there. But the majority of cases are politicized. The majority of cases are undergirded uh, by anti-Semitism. They have a specific goal in mind. Um, and whether it's to, um, as I said, legitimize anti-Semitism, whether it is, again, to be used in a certain program, we didn't even get into the whole um, subject of how the Holocaust is misapplied whether it's you know the anti-vaxxers or whether it's uh, I, I don't even know you know be so many different places uh, where the Holocaust is, you know uh, is is kind of distorted to create a political uh, point. Um, all those are done fairly intentionally, in my perspective. Um, it's very hard, and again, speaking about Western society, I think really ultimately it's very hard to find somebody who. Uh, um, can legitimately claim that they didn't know anything. Yeah, uh, uh, they didn't really know that the Holocaust happened out of ignorance, not out of, shall we say, spite. Carol, let me ask a question about which is often raised, and it was raised when the BBC had the question time with um, with Nick Griffin, and and somebody's asked online about your interview with uh, David Irving, right? Um, you presumably did that because you thought people would learn something from it, and maybe you learnt something from it yourself. And I wondered, I think the, the, the audience wonders whether you learned anything from it yourself. And is there ever any public interest served by conducting that listening to Holocaust deniers, for example, at all? I mean, I agree. I think it's very, I think it's a kind of case by case basis. And you have to be very careful that you don't just provide somebody with a platform which they can use for their own advantage. And, you know, I absolutely went and had to challenge David Irving. And I mean, for me, it wasn't about his views. Really. I mean, that the whole thing about that was that I, uh, it was about the fact that he was gaining this new generation of fans which were being fed to him by the algorithms of Google and Facebook and and YouTube, essentially. And, um, and that's the thing that I was trying to highlight there. Um, but, and I think it is, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think, like you say, the Nick Griffin question time uh, thing is is really problematic and these days as well that the reason i think there's an awful lot of naivety about about the way that broadcast coverage works these days in that it's not broadcast isn't no longer just its own medium it's the ways that that will be clipped and repackaged and put out on other platforms that's the real harm actually so i think I think BBC Question Time has continued, for example, to be very naive in that because they'll say, well, like, well, we challenged them. And so people could see, but that's not the way that it's going to be repackaged and presented to different audiences. So, 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 and it becomes a source of disinformation in itself. So, yeah, I think it's complex. I think the, 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 the context of it is really important. And I think on this sort of case by case basis, you've got to really think about it. 
Mark, let me read you a question from Andrew Wallace. Um, last month, a Cambridge University think tank, Centre for Geopolitics, chose to platform a known denier of the 1994 genocide of the Rwandan Tutsi in an online debate, despite widespread protests from survivor groups, academics and NGOs. Uh, the, the, the university did not even accept to platform someone, someone alongside the denier to challenge their views. And they cited the free speech uh, mantra in allowing her a platform. Is this an area that we should be increasingly worried about, where free speech at university allows genocide or Holocaust denial to be propagated unchallenged? I would agree with that. Um, I think that, first of all, anytime you allow, in any environment, denial or distortion of any significant historical event um, to be unchallenged is highly problematic. Uh, I think you know, one of the conception, our misconceptions of free speech is and again, it's, it's it's a cliche to a certain extent, is the fact that you can say something doesn't mean that you have to or should say something. Um, and, you know, I've often used the example, we gather everyone around a holiday table um, in our family, and we generally, if we want to keep relationships with the family members, do not point out the how someone has become slovenly and someone has become obese and someone is, you know, socially inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera. We kind of keep those thoughts to ourselves and try to keep, you know, <laughs> what civil you are you? in our head. <laughs> it may not be as entertaining. I haven't met one of these people. Better, you know, a good recipe for keeping the family unit going. Um, and the same thing applies socially in a way. Um, I, I think that, you know, sometimes we bend over backwards to prove our liberal credentials. Um, and, I'm, and, you know, liberal small c in this case. Um, I did a study a number of years ago that found that quite a number of uh, free speech or sites advocating free speech, and this was probably in uh, the, you know, the early days of the internet, were using as a test case the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So they were literally defending the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and reposting them and, 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 uh, you know, uh, and, and sort of um, giving them a shield under the rubric of protecting free speech. There are many other issues you could have done instead of choosing the protocols of the elders of Zion. And I question why that specifically became the poster child to defend free speech. Um, and I think in, this is really very similar. Um, and, and I don't know whether it's an academic you know, illness or whether it's something you know, to go along with it, but I think we really do have to and should think twice about the implications of what we're doing under, again, the heading of free speech um is it is it really healthy productive contributing um and so on um or whether it is just for shock value or or to offend carol let me uh, ask another question which has been put to us um and i think you'll be in a very good position to to answer this are our regulators out of touch with technology <laughs> do they not understand what is needed I mean, it's it's. I mean, it, here in Britain, I would have to say is that in particular, there is a complete. Um, I don't know, ignorance, denial, refusal to sort of accept certain truths. I mean, you know, just on the the the. So my particular. This is slightly off topic, but since I've had mm -hmm. this question, my particular mm -hmm. bugbear is around elections because our laws simply don't work anymore in this country. And um, the technology has completely undermined our entire the entire fabric of um, of the way that we hold elections in this country, and has undermined all of the rules. Um, there is there can be no enforcement really these days, and but we've had you know that's been abundantly pointed out in various reports, and Parliament is doing nothing whatsoever about it. So, um, and I don't know, I mean, I think one of the issues around all of this stuff is because there's a sort of politicisation of it that goes on. So in Britain, everything is seen through the sort of optics of, so much is seen through the optics of the referendum. And so this is somehow a kind of political issue. So rather than it being a sort of national security or other issues, and so that's why I sort of say I'm not sure if it's denial or or a sort of I think there is I think it perhaps as in the states which was it was only the insurrection that really brought it home to people the power and the reach and the extent and the scariness essentially 
of what is happening online. And in Britain, I think we haven't had that moment. We're a long way off that moment. The consequences of what is happening completely unimpeded on this, these platforms has not been brought home to us in the same way. You know, we are waiting for our January the 6th moment. I mean, I kind of dread to think what that will be, but I think... Um, I hope you can avoid it and, and, and still have, <laughs> learn the lessons from us so that I happy know. January 6th moment. Well, I know. Well, I, I don't. I don't. I don't feel that. I, Mark, I don't feel that we are. Uh, you know, I feel we're sort of still on the baby slopes. Well, let, let's let's uh, let's go with because it obviously, although although it's um, not exactly the same issue, it's analogous, and I think it's useful for our discussion. Let me just because one of the questions that that people want to know about is what we do about it. If uh, beyond. The, the things which you've said, you know, let's try and uh, regulate how much of it appears. But it's very, very difficult to counter lies. Uh, and the moment you are in, for example, a debate about whether or not the uh, pizza parlour um, being frequented by Hillary Clinton actually contains kidnapped children, um, you've already lost because you're in a fantasy world in which you're discussing mad things. Um a little bit occurs to me, maybe the case with with uh, Holocaust denial. You know, the moment we get drawn, the moment you get drawn in to trying to point out to someone where it is in Auschwitz that the gas canisters went, mm -hmm. you you already are on another planet. Um, and so, Mark, or both of you actually, but, but let's start with Mark and maybe Carol. You say this too. Do what does one do? Does one uh, one of the questions wants to know? Does one just flood the internet with um, truth? as a way of dealing with it? Um, how does one ca tackle lies? I'm not sure that there's any foolproof answer. If there is, I haven't heard it yet. Um, I think that one of the things that we've known about Holocaust denier or denial um, for years is that really only in rare circumstances should they be debated. First of all, debating applies an equality, a legitimacy, and sharing a platform and so on. And as, as you point out, that's already in a way you've lost. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Godwin's Law. Um, Mike Godwin was a um, American, uh, I think, civil liberties lawyer who was very involved in the early days of the internet. Um, I think he was one of the founders of the Electronic Freedom Foundation, which is sort of the bedrock of this wide open free speech approach to the internet. But he postulated something called Godwin's Law, which is essentially that in any given conversation online, at a certain point, if you keep going long enough with two opposing views, someone is going to bring up and play the Nazi card. Um, and his corollary to that was whoever did it automatically loses because they've run out of, you know, on point or factual information and they're just resorting to playing this kind of, you know, uh, um, I say ad hominem, but, it, but it's really, you know, ad hominem for the Nazi side that that's all they could resort to. And that's the ultimate signifier of evil make, you know, you bad, you Nazi end of discussion. And whoever plays that card ultimately lost. But he, so what I'm saying is that Godwin, even then, realized how ubiquitous this theme and topic was online. Um, I think that we have to um, avoid legitimizing to a certain extent as much as possible. I think one of the things that is necessary that we've always chosen to do is exposure. Who are the people saying this? This goes back to the David Irving trial. Uh, for example, what are, what are they saying and why are they saying it? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting in the pits with them, um, but it means that you're going to really try to shine a light on what's going on there. But I think it's also, and, and Daniel, this is what you were kind of alluding to earlier. It's a conspiracy theory. The, the end of the day, Holocaust denial is maybe one of the most successful conspiracy theories, and it's linked to others like the protocols, um, a whole range of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which are maybe the granddaddy of all conspiracy theories in the West and, how, and in some ways I think are, you know, kind of structural to some of, you know, thought patterns in Western society. Um, but it's a conspiracy theory. And I think the best thing you do with conspiracy theories is really make people aware that that's what they're looking at and kind of help expose them. Um, people who have dealt with the insurrection have talked about how difficult it is to pull family members out of QAnon once they're into it. Because once you go down that rabbit hole, as Carol said, um, your reality changes. So you're not even arguing on the same plane anymore. It's really to try to catch people before they get down there. And I think that's the important thing. Carol. 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to say. So the one of the one of my favourite tweets of all time, Mark, is from Mark Godwin in early 2017 when he he was like, "Forget it. You can call them Nazis because they are." He was like, "Consider Godwin's law suspended." And I, think <laughs> I didn't that, see that one. I think that's what's kind of. But I think that is the point: is that I actually, I, you know, I, 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 the, 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 like, we should not underestimate the scale of the threats out mm -hmm. there, the rise of authoritarianism and populism, and these movements. You know, this is we can see this that there is this illiberal movements in you know countries all across the world of which we are very definitively part of, and what is going on in our information space is intimately tied into that, and it's that. You know, the, 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 I, I always hesitate about putting too much, uh, too much of the onus upon people in that, you know, the idea that it's just like we just have to get better at using the Internet and it's all about literacy. And, you know, it's the, the fact is, is that this information is being served up by algorithms. Algorithms are not that they're not magical and they're not value neutral. They're coded by human beings based upon human inputs and human choices now those algorithms can be better they can be programmed to serve up you know content high grade content that is evidence based and you know all the rest of it instead of what is the most engaging content and that is you know we see this there's a there's a twitter account which every single day posts up the most engaged content on facebook and every day it is, you know, completely sort of, um, you know, very out there, conspiratorial right wingers uh, of you know, the most sort of inflammatory types. Now, that is because of the nature of these algorithms. And that is it is down to us, to our politicians, to our governments to be putting pressure on the platforms that, you know, this is unacceptable. I don't think we should accept it. I think that, you know, it's for it's for our sort of the survival of liberal democracy, essentially, is that we confront this situation and we do get these changes. Well, Mark and Carol, that has been totally fascinating for me. I've really uh, found that stimulating. There's lots for me uh, to think about. And I had a chance, uh, Carol, to ask you a question that I wanted to ask for a long time about the practicality of it. Got some great answers. Mark, I think the definitional the beginning you gave us was was really helpful, and I'm gonna I'm going to ask uh, Michelle to come back on onto the uh, call and uh, and say about give a word of thanks. Um, I just want to thank you, Daniel, for being an incredible chair, and um, thank you, Carol and Mark. You've done so much, Mark, for Holocaust denial and distortion. You have written so many articles. You're on so many committees. And I really hope, you know, this will make a huge difference. Carol, keep writing those features. We should try and put pressure on the government for regulation, as we said. And we will try and educate people more that they will have uh, less ignorance about Holocaust education. We really hope that this area will uh, improve. And uh, we thank you so much for such an interesting evening. We really do. I don't know if anybody else would like to say um, a few words before we say goodbye. But uh, and thank you, everyone, for watching. We have a huge audience, I know, this evening. And please join us again at JW3. We have many, many more very interesting and stimulating online and hopefully soon in person events. Thank you. And um, if anybody else would just like to say Carol, Mark and Daniel, let's say one one line. Um, thank you very much indeed. I really enjoyed doing it myself. That's my normal test of whether these events have worked. Is uh, Was I stimulating myself? And every minute of it was really, really interesting. Thank you very much to, to Carol and Mark and to you, Michelle, for all the work you did to organise it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.